So they can be a part of what you're unearthing in terms of the, the history, right? You've got to do it tactfully because next thing you know, you'll have the the lost city of the monkey god in association with a well-known coffee brand, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> well, uh, welcome to the stream, an unscripted, unedited, free-flowing conversation featuring guests who reject the status quo with a bias for action in the world of water and beyond. My name is Tom Freyberg. I'm an environmental journalist and content creator specializing in water. And I'm Will Sarney. I'm a water strategy consultant doing my part to solve wicked water problems. Thanks, Will. And don't forget to like and subscribe our channel. And this week's guest, we're pleased to be joined by Dr. Chris Fisher, who is an archaeologist, National Geographic explorer, professor of anthropology at Colorado State University, and the founder and director of the Earth Archive. Chris, potentially one of the coolest job titles we've had to introduce so far with a, a Geo National Geographic explorer. So welcome to the stream and uh, thanks for joining us. It's all that all sounds so much more impressive than it actually is. And, you know, especially the doctor thing, you know, when my daughter was, when my daughter was younger, I, you know, she'd be like, why do I have to take this medicine? Why? And I'm like, well, you know, I am a doctor. And she's like, well, if you're a doctor, then why do you have to go to a doctor when you're sick? Like I've, She's caught you I, out there. She's I caught stand, you out there. You should, you I, should stand, well, I can self-diagnose, you know, move on. But. <laughs> So yeah, that all sounds more impressive than it actually is. But thank you very much for that. Great stuff. Well, um, listen, Chris, great to, great to hear from you. You've got some super interesting uh, projects to talk about. But maybe to, to kind of get us started, normally we ask for people's kind of origin story if, if they're in the water community. Um, I took a look at your TED Talk last night. Um, great stuff. Uh, give us a kind of, just for people listening and watching, kind of the Earth Archive project, what it is, and really kind of how it's using LIDAR and what is LIDAR and, and kind of how you intend to map the entire planet. I mean, that's one hell of an, an ambition to get started with. Well, Chris is a young man, so he's got a long runway. Um, I'm not you know, that young. Decades to do this. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we'll over see. to you, Chris, yeah. Well, we'll see how, we'll see how long I last, but... Uh, um, yeah, so you know, I'm an, I'm trained as an art, as a traditional archaeologist, which is a you know boots on the ground kind of person, uh, and I was trained to use technologies that uh, I, you know some of them date to the, the turn of the last century, uh, and and I, and I came up doing that, and in the process of doing archaeological survey, traditional archaeological survey, which is you know basically it's a a group of people that get in a line and they trained people and they, you know, walk across the landscape and they look for archaeological sites. And it can be very, you know, rewarding and find all sorts of cool stuff. Um, it can be challenging. You know, you can forget your lunch and forget where you parked your car. Uh, you know, you can get chased by wild dogs. Uh, you can fall down and rip your pants open. Um, you can have a crappy lunch. You can get back to your car and find a flat tire or four flat tires. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, um, it's kind of straight ahead archaeology. And in the process of doing that, in 2010, or uh, actually 2009, we discovered, uh, myself and my team in Western Mexico, we discovered a city that we, we didn't know was there. And it occupies a really rugged landform. It's, um, it's called the Mal Pais locally and because of that ruggedness it wasn't suitable for modern agriculture and it served to preserve thousands of house members. you can't see it from the air it's completely covered by vegetation it's obscured and we surveyed that using jeeps pretty sophisticated gps units and train crews and mapping every house foundation that we saw doing urban mapping for two years and at the end of the two years we covered about we could cover about one square kilometer at a time. At that time, we thought the city covered about 10 square kilometers. We now know that it covers 26 square kilometers. So it's a monster of a city with thousands and thousands of house foundations. And so after a couple of years, I, I got back you know, here to Colorado and I started this semester in the fall. And I walked down the hall to a colleague of mine's office, Steve Lees, who's actually the 
the co-director of the Earth Archive. And I pounded on his door and I'm like, dude, there's got to be a better way. This is going to take us forever. Like, you know, on a, on a traditional academic timeline, this is what you would do for the rest of your career. You'd spend a decade or more surveying the city. Then you would absorb what you learn. You'd have questions about the city, how it was organized, how it came to be. And you'd go and excavate. And I, I'm just really an impatient person. It's just, it's just too much. And, and Steve was like, well, have you heard of this thing called LIDAR? I'm like, what in the hell is that? So we had enough money in the budget to do a LIDAR scan uh, of 10 square kilometers. And we, and we did that scan. We learned, taught ourselves how to analyze the data. We looked at the data. And when I first saw the first hill shade, which is a product that's created from the LIDAR data that allows you to see the landscape, it allows you to digitally remove the vegetation so you can see the archeological features below, it's just blown away because it had mapped in incredible detail, thousands of house foundations, pyramids, roads, granaries, everything that you'd expect to see in an ancient city, but in such a detail that, it, I mean, it wouldn't be possible for us to map it in that kind of detail on the ground. So using those LIDAR data, we immediately started excavating because we learned enough from those LIDAR data to be able to do that. That led to a project that I did in, in, in Honduras that uh, many people know as the Lost City of the Monkey God, where we actually found a unknown or very poorly documented ancient culture that occupied much of the uh, Mosquiti area of Honduras and Nicaragua. And from that work, I came to understand that these LIDAR records represent the ultimate conservation records. Right. And it's because, you know, LIDAR is this amazing technology. We use airborne LIDAR. And LIDAR is this technology that's found in, you know, self-driving cars, robots, and all sorts of crazy stuff. We use airborne, uh, airborne LIDAR. Using some sort of aerial platform, plane, helicopter, could be a drone. You have an instrument on that platform that fires down a grid of infrared beams, uh, 500,000 pulses per second in some instances. That grid of beams is, and when one of those beams touches something on the Earth's surface, could be a leaf, could be a bird, could be the ground surface, could be the trunk of a tree, returns back to the aircraft and it gives you a measure of distance. That grid of pulses is so dense that no matter how dense the vegetation is, it will penetrate down to the ground surface. Now you may only get a small percentage of pulses that penetrate to the ground surface and return to the aircraft, but it's enough to give you a high resolution picture of the Earth's surface. But it also records everything between the ground surface and the uppermost point on the landscape. Chris, could not to diminish the value of, you know, archaeology, but one of the things that I, I found of uh, pretty significant value and use case was what you just touched on, which is that difference between the top of the canopy and the land surface and structures as it relates to carbon accounting, potentially carbon trading, carbon budget, you know. So, I mean, what you're doing has a number of different use cases and value to a broad group of stakeholders. Yeah, so when you, when you do one of these LIDAR scans, what you get back is not a photograph. It's a 3D cloud of points it represents the Earth's surface and everything on it. So as an archeologist, I practice digital deforestation. I spend hours stripping away the vegetation so I can see the archeology <laughs> below. But all of that stuff that I'm painstakingly stripping away are the careers of hundreds of other scientists who are studying just that. Tree size, composition, species composition, geology, hydrology, water budgets, et cetera. Uh, and that's what makes these the ultimate conservation records. So it pains me to say this, in pro and I may right now, after I say this, be struck dead by a bolt of lightning from the archeology span gods. 
We'll see. We'll see how this goes. Let's hope not. Yeah. But, but um, the archaeology part of this, the archaeology part of this equation, is possibly the least important bit of it. The ecology, the water budgets, the carbon determinations. These are, you know, especially given what is happening today in terms of climate change, these are these are things that are incredibly important. Essentially, as part of your digital deforestation, by removing all those, you're removing the stuff that's essentially the core work and in interest of many other disciplines and scientists, right? So, yeah, you know, we're going to get a lot of comments on that, by the way. Oh, yeah, Chris, he's the digital deforestation guy. <laughs> I wish that yeah, we, we need to think about how we word that, Chris, moving forward, right? Yeah, or we could just put you on mute when uh, this gets, you know, released. Uh, I've you know. already, said, I've said it a million times. You can say it again, and I didn't even. Yeah. So, um, and when I and when we filter that, by the way, when we filter those data sets, we're basically collecting, we're basically creating categories of data sets of data that we turn up or on. So we never remove the data technically, we're just painting it or flagging it so that we can turn it off. But somebody can go back to the original data or they can go back to our filtered version and turn those data back on. So you never remove the data. You're just kind of obscuring it so you can see what's, what's below. Uh, which is another really cool thing about, about the LIDAR in that the kinds of sets that you can create are sort of infinite. Right. And right now our ability to collect these LIDAR records, to, to collect and understand these LIDAR records is kind of in its infancy. You know, 10 years from now, it's our belief, 10 years, 20 years, maybe a hundred years, that people will be going back through these LIDAR records using AI and, and computer techniques that we can't conceive of asking questions that we wouldn't have thought of today and using these data in incredibly innovative ways. But the key, and this is what the Earth Archive is about, is that the Earth is changing so rapidly that we have a very limited time to record the Earth as it exists now as a legacy for future generations. And that's what the Earth Archive is about. It's about promoting scans, especially in areas where uh, there, you, where the resources just aren't there to scan them, uh, to scan those areas now to create a permanent three-dimensional record of the Earth's surface and everything on it in those places. So presumably, this um, is an incredibly data-heavy exercise. The volume that you're going to generate, how on earth, where, where is that going to be stored? If you're thinking about, <laughs> I'm just thinking this goes beyond gigabytes, terabytes. This is, I mean, it's presumably because it's so high resolution and packed that also comes with a quite a heavy uh, memory footprint. So in terms of securing that safely, when you hear about historic records being altered, um, altered throughout time, right? Um, so there's, there's a, yeah, where and how is, is that going to be stored? That's, a, that's an interesting question. And, and unfortunately, I don't have a, like, this is an answer that storage will always be an issue in terms of space, format, where, right. all that sort of stuff. And it will always be an evolving question. There never will be one single answer for that, for that, for that issue. Um, and, you know, there are people that, uh, scientists that just study storage that are really, you know, excited by <laughs> the idea of just tackling this issue. But we have to, it's a, it's a big, it's a big task and that we have to create two kinds of database. We need to create a static database, which is something that is akin to a digital seed bank where the original data is kept in its unaltered form as, as a, as a permanent record. Probably the format and the way that those data are kept will evolve over time. So it's not truly a static database. And then we need to create a dynamic database in which people are able to pull data from that database, but also deposit it in an altered form. And Ultimately, also, the, 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 the storage technology is going to evolve as this project progresses, right? I mean, who would have thought 10 years ago we were using cloud storage as much as we do now? So Yeah, yeah. so 
so the storage, so the storage issue is always going to be, there never will be. So, you know, when we first started talking about this, I'm like, oh, this is going to be so easy. We're just going to look, we're just going to create a, what we're calling a digital seed bank. And it's going to be like in some, you know, uh, protected, obscure area of the world. Right. Um, somewhere, yeah. Like a Dakota. It'll go to, it'll go to a Dakota. It'll go to, you know, someplace in, in North Dakota and it'll sit there in a thing where nobody ever goes. And, but that's not how it, it's actually going to work. It's going to be like this constantly evolving sort of issue, even with the static. It, right. Chris, you, yeah. Sorry, go on, Mo. No, I, I, I think we should sort of geek out on a, tra a tangent a little bit, um, in, in part because, you know, Tom and I more often than not talk about digital technologies, and this is a really uh, not just interesting, but powerful one. Can you talk about voxels and, you know, sure. the, it, you know, you're creating a packet of data for a unique location. And, you know, what does that look like? And it, it ties into storage in a way. Yeah, so, um, and I should say I speak geek, but I'm not entirely fluent in it. So I'll, I'll dip in and out of it. But um, we're partnering with a company called Voxel Maps. And this company has, for, for our um, online interface. So another issue with the Earth Archive is being able to view the data online, serve it up and disseminate it. And we're, so we're partnering with this company called Voxel Maps, which have, has created this incredibly innovative 21st century way of basically mapping the Earth. And so, we're all familiar with the pixel. It's a one-dimensional uh, uh, unit of, of space, uh, and it's uh, you know can have multiple multiple resolutions, etc. A pixel holds one unit of information. So if you want to have a map that has multiple units of information on it, you have to stack layers that have pixels, right? So you have a layer that might have some hydrological information. You might have a layer that has elevation information, uh, et cetera. A voxel, which is a, a concept that's been around for a, a, a long time. I mean, when people sort of first started thinking about pixels, they thought about voxels. And a voxel is a three-dimensional pixel. So it's like a cube. And voxels have been, and so voxels were, the, it was a kind of a conceptual thing. It wasn't very useful because for the longest time, we just didn't have the computing power to be, to be able to deal with it. Right. Now, now that's starting to come online. And so voxels are used in uh, a lot of like robotic applications, for example, where they create a, a voxel landscape immediately in front of the robot to help it you know, sort of figure out where to move and identify things, all sorts of things. And the self-driving cars a little bit. Gaming has used voxels because it's a, uh, um, you know, kind of a constrained environment that they can map in advance. So for example, Minecraft is a voxel environment. So it's depth, isn't it? It's the, as opposed to looking at pixels in a 2D, uh, yeah. a rate of like a 4K or an 8K TV, you're actually, you can stack these cubes and then from a robotic point of view, you can see the depth of, of how they're stacked, right? Gotcha. Right. And so what, what voxel maps do in is they, created a voxel grid over the entire earth. So they start with the center of the earth, the conceptual center of the earth mm. and a voxel there. Um, and voxels are multi-resolution so you can stack them together. And then they built outward from that, from that earth space. And they basically cover the entire earth and beyond the atmosphere with voxels that have unique address, addressing systems. So they're holding three-dimensional data. Now, the amazing thing about voxels is that they can hold unlimited amounts of data. And right now they're actually limited by computing power, but they theoretically they can hold, and they can hold time information. So not only are they three-dimensional, they're actually four-dimensional. And they are, they go sort of, start at the center of the earth and, and go out into the atmosphere. So they, 
encompass not just the surface of the earth, but actually underneath the surface. So they are a way to store and hold three-dimensional three -dimensional data. And so we're using a voxel maps platform to actually store and disseminate the uh, Earth Archive data. And there's all sorts of crazy stuff about um, voxels, like where do you start the, the numbering system? You know, voxels theoretically, uh, you could use voxels to map the entire universe, solar system. So is it Earth centric to start numbering um, the voxel system at the center of the Earth? Should it be the center of the sun? Should it be the center of the milk? I mean, all sorts of crazy, you know, is, are you going to use voxels to, um, uh, is this when you navigate in space, are you going to use, are you going to go to like a voxel location in space because you can map outer space? And, I mean, there's a lot of crazy tangents you can go on, but we're going to use them to start with. We're going to use them just for the, just for the, just for the, and voxel maps is, is doing that. So we're partnering with them to use their, their platform to, to be able to do that. And what's also really interesting about the voxel platform is that you can create sets of voxels. They're actually called bloxels. I didn't name it. This is in the literature. They named it bloxels. You can't make this up. It. This is wild. <laughs> I know. I would, say, I would have come up with something better than bloxels. You can imagine but, uh, them sat around the table. Right, guys, we need a really creative name <laughs> yeah. for a collective group of voxels. I've got it, guys. I've got it. Yeah. <laughs> But you can create sex of, sets of um, voxels, bloxels. Bloxels is a set of voxels, right? Okay, cool. That have different um, different information inside of them, including time. And if the uh, conceptual and analytical implications of that are pretty intense, and we're going to start exploring that as as well. So it's a time. So it's a three D digital pixel that's a time stamp of the environment at that given time when it's scanned, right? That's pretty. Um... That's what LIDAR is. Yeah. So a voxel is actually, can a voxel is, is all of that. Plus you can have multiple time states inside of it. Right. So it's actually, that actually makes it more than that. The applications here, um, you know, just really uh, took me back in terms of thinking about, you know, what you can do with LIDAR from a, you know, carbon, carbon accounting, carbon trading, you know, CDM projects and, and so on. And then once, you know, I learned more about uh, what a voxel is, uh, you know, there are a number of applications in the world of water in terms of, you know, acquiring and storing data at that unique location that, you know, right now is, you know, archaic. In terms of mapping water quantity, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, quantity, quality, yeah. Uh, you know, ecosystem attributes. Uh, you know, it amazing in terms of uh, the power of that way of more, you know, storing data. Hundred percent. Yeah. Different time states. Yeah. Uh, associated with you know, uh, like like you know different levels of the river in different voxels could you know, be a high. I mean, there's uh, amazing um, poten potential applications and stuff that we are not even, you know, there's, there's applications here that we're, that we're, that we're just not tuned in enough to understand, to know, I mean, and, and that, that we need some advance to be able to sort of understand. So, you know, 10 years from now, I think people will be using this technology and, and conceptually, conceptually using voxels to uh, do analytics that are just crazy stuff that we can't even sort of think of right now. So, so where are you right now then, Chris, in terms of the progress of the Earth Archive project? Because um, I, I looked it up and it, you've estimated it's going to cost 5 billion US dollars to map the entire planet's land mass, mass, right? I think that's good value for money, to be honest with you, five billion to completely map it. But um, where where are you starting and what's the kind of rollout for this? You mentioned the, the Voxel, Bloxel partnership. Um, so where, where, give us some progress on where you are. So we have other partnerships that are coming online, the storage companies and 
and and other sorts of things um, to help support and move the uh, Earth Archive uh, forward. We want to map the entire surface of the landmass of the Earth, which you're which is, you, you are correct. We estimate would cost around five billion dollars U.S. with a B um, to map that. It seems like an incredible amount of money, but considering what you get for that money, I actually think it's that much. Money. Uh, not that I can write a check for that, but um, there are people that could. Right. Uh, they, might, they might be listening, Chris. You never know. Well, that would be awesome. Um, but we don't ha actually have to do the entire surface here. There are many uh, countries that are that have national mapping initiatives that are already mapping and open sourcing. And that's another thing I forgot to mention about the Earth Archive is that we want to open source all the data. So we want to make it freely available uh, as a as a, a global heritage legacy that people can use and learn from uh, and analyze. And um, so. There are already companies or there are already countries that are doing this. A lot of Northern European countries are, are LIDAR scanning their entire country and um, open sourcing those data. The United States has an amazing program called 3 Depth that is uh, sponsored by the USGS. Um, and they're trying, they're, they will LIDAR scan the entire uh, United States. Unfortunately, the resolution that they're doing that that project in it's not as high as we would um, we would like, and of course I should also mention that right now we don't have a spaceborne instrument that can scan the Earth at the kind of resolution that we're sort of requiring, which is a pixel size or a voxel size of twenty five centimeters, the twenty five centimeters on the side, right. uh, which would mean that you would be able to uh, identify individual trees. And you'd be able to see something on the ground that's about as big as a construction brick, uh, you know, like a masonry brick. So um, we don't actually have to scan the entire earth, but we want to start with areas that are most threatened. And we especially want to kickstart scans in areas that are changing rapidly and that, um, for a whole host of reasons, may not have the resources to do these scans. And the place that we want to start with. The most obvious place to our way of thinking is the Amazon, which we believe we could scan in five years for $20 million, a lot less than, than $5 billion. So $20 million, we think we could scan the, um, uh, the entire Amazon. We have some money and we would have begun that scan in the spring of 2020, except for the the pandemic, the COVID really uh, threw a, a monkey wrench into our plans to, to begin scanning. So as soon as uh, the, the pandemic situation clears out a little bit in the Americas, we will be able to initiate that LIDAR scan of the Amazon. We're also at the beginning of February gonna initiate a Kickstarter campaign to, uh, be, to, to provide funding to help us do that scan. So we have partners in Brazil, Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador, and we will have partners in Peru to uh, begin scanning air. And as you, as you may probably know, the Amazon, it's absolutely huge. It's the size of the continental United States. It covers nine countries. Um, it's an absolutely massive project. And we wanna start this scan as soon as we can, as soon as the, the, the COVID crisis clears a little bit, um, in six areas in Brazil, um, two in Colombia, and perhaps one in, in Bolivia. We'll be able to do that in 2021. So you're looking to raise what, between half a million and a million US dollars to kickstart this initial Amazon project, right? The initial yeah. Kickstarter, we would like to raise between half a million and a million dollars. We think we can scan the entire Amazon for twenty million dollars. Okay, so what? Which, so, again, so yeah, run like, us through kind of as amount of money. Yeah, but it's actually not that much money considering the kinds of data that you would get and the sort of information that you get. Right. Um, and talk about legacy building. You know, this is 
This well, think about if, if you're talking about all those digital layers in terms of mapping the, the levels of biodiversity which are being affected by deforestation, mapping all those different data sets that could, if they're made open source to scientists around the world. I mean, that's, um, yeah, it's a lot of money, but it sounds uh, incredible value as well. So what, uh, just run me through, people who actually take part in the Kickstarter and the funding, what do they, what's their involvement in the project? Because that's kind of the part in terms of having equity in the in the project or some kind of ownership. What what uh, if people are listening? They think you know what this sounds great. We'd love to put some money involved. But what's the ownership model on that? We're kind of developing that right now, but certainly people would be able to. Um, you will have a mechanism that will make them aware of what's happening with the scan and the kinds of things that we've discovered from the scan um, in we're eventually working on a, a system that will allow people to uh for for the for uh you know a, a certain a certain kind of donation allows a message to be placed in the metadata for the scan so each point in their um you know in a scan for an area that they support might have their message of hope or peace or um a poem from John, a line from a poem from John Muir or something, or their name even in the metadata, which would persist as long as people are using those data, which could be forever. I mean, you know. That's pretty cool. Century. That's pretty cool. So it's kind of like a digital legacy or footprint or message. If this data is going to continue to be used for years and years to come, that people will see, right? Yeah. And it's kind of like, a you know, people inscribe their, Put their name or message on on the brick in an atrium of a museum or on a park bench or something like that and, you know i don't know what the lifespan of a park bench is i guess it kind of depends on where it is in the world but uh you know putting your putting it your name where it is. pardon it depends where it is yeah yeah but putting your putting your name in the the metadata for one of these scans is certainly going to have much like longer lifespan than it would be to, to do that right, right. not that I'm, downplaying the importance of sponsoring a park bench somewhere but you know just you, you bring up an interesting point you know 20 million might sound like a lot but it's really not in the scheme of things and you know if you look at certainly what corporations are investing right now in you know their climate programs even investment funds you know 20 million is, is not a lot of money for something that creates uh you know enormous value through different use cases you know the, the archaeology side you know the water side the you know ecosystem side uh you know the carbon accounting piece uh yeah it's just really not a lot of money i mean you will you know if you spot were to sponsor one of these if a corporation was to sponsor one of these scans in a big way they will be assured that they they will discover in those scans unknown settlements ancient settlements, cities, perhaps cultures, landscape, human modified landscapes. Um, so they can be a part of what you're unearthing in terms of the, the history, right? Absolutely. Different kinds of um, combinations of ecological features, maybe new species. Uh, they will improve carbon, you know, carbon budgets, water budgets, water management systems, ecological systems. Uh, my, helping in, indigenous people identify and manage uh, lands. I mean, the, the list is like, uh, it, it's it's endless. It's ama amazing to be able to have a bit of that. Like, I guess you've got to do it tactfully because next thing you know, you'll have the, the lost city of the monkey god in association with a well-known coffee brand, right? So <laughs> <laughs> you've got you to gotta be careful that corporations don't suddenly, but I know what you're saying in terms of, being helping to fund something like that and unearthing new settlements, ancient civilizations yeah. that we didn't know about. I mean, that's if that means if that means we know about it before it's before it's destroyed. I'm right. I'm okay yeah. I mean, because we're losing archaeology. Just to, just to, to step into the to wear my archaeology hat, and you know, I'm not an ecologist. I can't wear it. I'm not officially can't wear an ecology hat. But we can say the same thing about you know the ecological side of things or whatever. But we're losing archaeological sites at such a rapid clip right yeah. now that um, 
we need to do everything we possibly can to document as much of the archaeology as we can before it's gone forever. And that's the that's you know that's the crazy thing when you know you think about the Amazon, you think about these scans, and you know the Amazon is just one example. We could go many other places in the world and and come up with similar examples, but. Um, you know, in my in my TED talk, I used the, the example of Notre Dame, uh, and we all watched it as you know in horror. Fires, yeah. And uh, as it you know as it was damaged or practically destroyed in in that fire, and um, miraculously, you know, art historian Andrew Talon and his team, Paul Blair and some other folks, scanned the cathedral in 2014 using terrestrial light. And you know, their goal at the time was just to kind of I mean, it was built in multiple episodes. There's, there weren't good records of how that was done. And so they wanted to kind of understand more about the cathedral and how to, you know, you know, how to preserve it and all that sort of stuff. And that scan is going to be, well, it's not a single scan. It was like, you know, many scans. Over it. But that, that project will be invaluable for whatever form the reconstruction of the cathedral takes. We're losing, you know, to my way of thinking, we're losing thousands of ecological cathedrals every day in the Amazon. And we don't have any record of them at all. We'll never know. Ecological cathedrals, archeological sites, natural wonders and features, landscapes, amazing landscapes. Once they're gone, we will never have a record of those places. Hey, Chris, and the LIDAR will provide us with that record. Sorry, well. Well, no, no, no. I, I... I want to intervene because I want to talk about what you're doing as an intervention. And, you know, when I hear about, well, we want to memorialize, we want to catalog what we have. So when we don't have it, we know what we had. I mean, that's what I hear. And I, I think about it, for, you know, I want to say very differently, which is viewing the cataloging as an intervention so you don't lose it. Do you well, know I think it's a little. I think it's a little bit of both. But well, it's I, a little bit of both, but I, you know, I'm an optimist. So, you know, I, I don't want to view this as, yeah, we're, we're creating a catalog so people know that we totally screwed things up and we can look back. You know, I, I look at it as the act of engaging with corporations and NGOs and the public sector in cataloging this right is a way to, to quantify the value so we don't destroy the heck out of natural capital um do, there, there's in, at least in my mind there's a big difference between those two in terms of how you engage people on giving you the 20 million and and by the way tom and i We've been texting each other. We're prepared to give you that twenty million because we were going to go buy park benches. So uh, we've got the money allocated already. I wonder how many. We, we might have a we might have a better name for block source as well. Just putting out there. I don't want to completely I, fundamentally um, rewrite, already, rewrite the, the, the systems in place. My, but that's out of my control. <laughs> the I can't, we can't do anything about that. I wonder how many park benches twenty million dollars would be, or how much it costs. Well, it it depends. I mean, you know, if you're in New York, it might be two. Right, you know, there's a higher yeah. park bench real estate price there, right? So yeah, I should actually look that up. I think it's a, it's a, it's a bit of both. I think it's a bit of, yeah. of both things. Well, and I think that in an ideal situation, yeah, we would, we, we would do that to, um, uh, you know, prevent. Um, sorry, my dog is going crazy. About something. We would do that to prevent. Um, <laughs> Yeah, welcome to the COVID world here. I think the, the uh, dogs may be calling out Will's 20 million offer there. Just he's probably been I, listening in and the, the dog <laughs> is on one of the park benches or something. I don't know. <laughs> oh, the <laughs> irony of it. Beautiful. <laughs> um, well, Chris, listen, we're kind of at that magic, just gone the 30 minute mark. I'm sure we could have continued talking for, for many more minutes on this. We'd, we'd love to have you kind of back on after the yeah. um, Kickstarter scheme um to get going with the amazon project that's fascinating so wish you the best of luck for that and 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 hopefully you'll you'll get to that magic half a million to a million mark um but hugely supportive of this and i think the power in 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 cataloging 
the earth digitally and making that open source for different scientists around the world to study is uh, is pretty phenomenal so yeah we really want to thank you for your time and effort on the on the stream and wish you the best of luck uh, will closing closing comments from you um you know final thought absolutely love what chris is doing and the team and uh the power of the project and everything that comes out of the project in terms of things that we can understand right now and things that we we don't have a clue about in terms of how do you, what can you do with a voxel and what right. can you do with carbon accounting so I, i'm really excited with this en enormously great well, stuff. awesome thank you thank you guys so much for for having me it was a lot of fun Great stuff. Well, uh, Chris, we want to thank you for your time and uh, everyone listening, make sure you uh, like and subscribe to the channel and uh, stay tuned for, for more interviews like this. So, uh, guys, thanks again and uh, we'll speak to you soon. Be thank well. you so much. Thanks.